Okay, welcome to the morning session. This is the last course uh, of an EK on Poisson geometry. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, and thanks for those who are still here. It's been a long week. And um, okay, in this last lecture, what I would like to tell you about is um, well, a little bit of the theory of, of Dirac structures. So Dirac structures, they are actually an outgrowth of Poisson geometry. So they are a um, more general concept, but it turns out that it's very convenient to, to you know, um, regard Poisson geometry as a particular case of these objects. You know, these objects actually clarify many constructions in Poisson geometry. Um, so even if you, you know, if you only care about Poisson structures, it's still very useful to, you know, to, to have these guys in mind. Okay. And I'll try to justify why. So <clears throat> uh, my plan for today um, so it's basically to focus on Dirac structures. So I'll start with some motivation and then give the definition, key examples and main properties. And towards the end, um, you know, talk about applications to Poisson geometry and perhaps a bit beyond Poisson geometry even. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So um, as a motivation, let me start with some motivation then. You know, so uh, I will go back to this idea of symplectic manifolds being phase spaces for classical mechanical systems, right? So <clears throat> um, we could be all happy about this and think that this is, you know, the end of the story, right? So you model phase spaces in classical mechanics with a symplectic manifold. But then as we saw, um, if you consider, um, symplectic manifolds with symmetries, and if you want to consider orbit spaces of that, then you are no longer in the symplectic world, right? You're forced to consider Poisson brackets, which are more general, right? So, um, so if you have, just recalling that if you have a symplectic manifold acted upon by a Lie group in a nice way, and you go to the orbit space, this guy acquires a Poisson bracket that is no longer symplectic, okay? So, okay, we do um, Poisson geometry and we notice that Poisson geometry is actually kind of stable under this operation of taking quotients. So if this guy is a Poisson structure and your Lie group preserves it, then the quotient will be Poisson again, right? But there's something else that you may <clears throat> want to consider when doing, post, um, when doing symplectic, symplectic geometry, which is the operation, and we do that all the time, of passing to a submanifold. Okay, so why would you do that? You know, if your Hamiltonian system has conserved quantities, for example, the dynamics will be constrained to a submanifold. Um, for example, it could, or if you're doing reduction, this could be the level set of a moment map, right? So in general, when you pull back a symplectic form to a submanifold, this is no longer symplectic. It's only a closed two form that could be even zero when this, for example, is isotropic or Lagrangian, okay? So the intrinsic geometry of constraints inside a, a symplectic manifold is just a closed two form, okay? So that's a second thing that you may want to consider. And um, the idea of Dirac geometry is that, you know, is wondering what happens if now, now you take a submanifold or, you know, some kind of, you consider constraints inside a Poisson phase space now, right? You can have both. You can have a Poisson phase space and in there, consider a submanifold. So what is the intrinsic submanifold of a Poisson manifold? What's the intrinsic geometry of a submanifold of a Poisson manifold? Okay, so one thing to be clear is that, you know, these Dirac structures, they are 
you know, to Poisson structures, what close two forms are to symplectic structures. So that's in short the idea. Okay. Um, um, okay. And yeah, so, um, an inter so, you know, a good viewpoint for this is that just to, to make this a bit more clear is that, you know, when you are in the symplectic world, you really have, you know, two alternative ways to look at a symplectic structure, which are completely equivalent. You can look at them as a non-degenerate um, closed two form, right, closed. Or you may choose to look at them as a non-degenerate Poisson structure which is given by a bivector, right? In the non-degenerate case, it doesn't really matter if you look at it as a two-form or as a bivector. One is the inverse of the other, right? So if you want to, the point is that if you want to, um, you know, consider quotients, it's more convenient to think of this as a non-degenerate bivector field because then it's more convenient to push it forward, right? Whereas, if you want to, you know, pull it back to a submanifold, it's more convenient to look at it as a form. And the result here will be a form and the result here will be a bivector, except that you drop the non-degeneracy condition. The result of the operation uh, is no longer non-degenerate. So what I'm trying to get to is the fact that there are two ways in which you can degenerate symplectic structures. You can view them as a non-degenerate two form and drop non-degeneracy, or you can view them as a non-degenerate bivector field and drop non-degeneracy. And each one leads to a different kind of geometry, right? And Dirac structures will try to unify them. And um, so why, so that's the kind of one of the guiding questions. And um, <clears throat> yeah, so as I said, you know, Dirac structures, they are about um, sub-manifolds now of Poisson phase spaces trying to understand, you know, what kind of geometrical structures or geometrical structure this guy inherits. And um, so Dirac structures, they are named after Dirac, who was, you know, um, who studied um, submanifolds and constraints in, in, in physical systems. And um, one of the many things that made Dirac famous is actually a certain formula that one sees in, in physics books, and it's also in our problem set, okay? And so what, what is this formula, okay? What, what does it represent, and what does it have to do with anything that I'm, I was talking about? So this formula is derived as follows. So, that's, so the problem is like this. So suppose that you have a symplectic manifold, Okay, and suppose that you have a submanifold, a constrained submanifold in there. And suppose that you are in the lucky situation that the pullback of the form is symplectic again. So suppose that it's symplectic again. That's what Dirac called first class or second class. Yeah, second class. So first class squares are chopped, but yeah, second class. Okay, um, in this case, you see, because this happens to be symplectic again, you can invert and find the Poisson bracket here. So this has its own Poisson bracket, which is the inverse of this guy. Right, and this has its own Poisson bracket. And the question is, what's the relationship between these two Poisson brackets, right? If this was a Poisson map, this relationship would be very easy, right? You know, what, what would, would, would that be, right? If you want to compute this Poisson bracket for two functions here, you just extend them to S in whatever way you want. You bracket them in S and then restrict again. This is what it means for the inclusion to be a Poisson map. But we also saw in the problem set that this is not a Poisson map. This can't be a Poisson map. 
okay? But yet, you know, this is inheriting a Poisson structure. So, you know, there's a different way that, you know, submanifolds inherit Poisson brackets, you know, that is not really, you know, so simple if you express them in terms of the Poisson structures. So Dirac structures will clarify that, okay? There's a certain way that you can pull back um, Poisson brackets, but then you get formulas like, like this one, okay? Good. So again, the, the two guiding questions, motivating questions here will be, you know, this unification of these two types of degenerate symplectic structures, like pre-symplectic, which is just a closed two form or a Poisson in general. And, you know, perhaps also answer this question, which is, you know, like, you know, what, what do you have to do to actually pull back a Poisson bracket? How can you do that? So the key idea that goes back to Weinstein um, and Courant is that in order to accommodate um, Poisson structures and close two forms in a common framework, you know, you should consider the sum of T plus T star, okay? Uh, why? So once you do that, so if you consider T plus T star, right? So we have, so we want to somehow have a common framework to study closed two forms and Poisson structures are given by bivector fields. Um, so here, the main point is that, remember that a two form, you can view as a bundle map from T to T star, whereas a bivector field gives rise to this sharp map that goes from T star M to TM. And now you can consider their graphs inside T plus T star, okay? So you can consider L omega to be the pairs X and contraction of omega with X for X and TM and L pi to be the graph of this sharp map, which you can write as And both graphs, they live inside this extended generalized tangent bundle, T plus T star, okay? So we can wonder, you know, now what do they have in common? So what do they have in common? One obvious thing is that they have the same rank. So they both have rank equal to the dimension of M, right? So rank. Yes. Why? No, we don't have to assume anything. Yeah. No, this makes perfect sense um, if they are non-degenerate. If they are degenerate. I'm sorry. Um, so, in order to explain or to show you another feature that these two graphs share. It's convenient for me to introduce or to notice that there is a certain, um, you know, fiber-wise symmetric pairing in T plus T star, okay? Which is given by as follows. So it's a symmetric fiber-wise pairing. Um, basically, I pair vectors and co-vectors. So it's something that is intrinsically defined on T plus T star. So you have this kind of inner product, fiber-wise inner product, except that this is not, not positive definite. This has signature, okay? And then remember that the skew symmetry of these two tensors will tell you that, 
So two properties will tell you that, you know, um, so how, how should I write that? This is the skew symmetry of the two form. So it satisfies this property. And the bivector field satisfy an equation, satisfies an equation like this. Right? And these equations, what they say in terms of this bracket is that, so that here's a definition. I'll say that a sub bundle of t plus t star is um, isotropic if this bracket restricted to this sub, sub bundle is zero. Okay. And um, I'll say that this is Lagrangian. If I'm running out of space here, it is isotropic, and the rank equals the dimension of M, which is half of the dimension of T plus T star, of the rank of T plus T star. Okay? And what you can check is that a common property of these two graphs view the sub bundles of, two, of T plus T star is that they are both Lagrangian. So now note Okay, so the fact that it's isotropic, that they are isotropic, are exactly these properties here. So they encode this Q symmetry of the tensors. And they have the right rank because they are graphs. Okay, and being Lagrangian, this is also equivalent to saying that they are self orthogonal with respect to this pairing. Okay, so that's the beginning. You know, so okay, so we identify the property that you know both graphs share. So we are marching towards this definition of Dirac structure. Now there is something that we haven't taken into account yet, which is integrability. Right? So I'm not only considering two forms or interested in two forms or by vector fields, but I want my two forms to be closed. And I want my bivector fields to be integrable in the sense of Poisson structures. Okay, and that's a much trickier problem now um, to, you know, to encode these integrability conditions, um, you know, to view them in terms of the graphs or view them, you know, in terms of something defined on TM. Okay, so how, how do you do that? So this was actually part, you know, basically the, the PhD thesis or you know, problem and then thesis of Ted Current, who was a student of Alan Weinstein in the late 80s. And that's the problem he solved in his thesis. Okay, so what he did was to identify on T plus T star, an additional structure, actually a bracket that exactly measures this and this, these kind of integrability conditions you know, um, when you consider graphs of two forms or by vector fields, okay? So um, this is what I just said, okay? So I just explained what they have in common. So we already figured out that they are both Lagrangian sub bundles with respect to this natural pairing. And now, you know, we have this problem to solve, which is like how to encode integrability, okay? So, <clears throat> What Courant did was, you know, to define the first, um, well, to provide the first definition or the first example of a, what is now called the Courant algebraic. So what is this? So in this case, it's C plus T star. 
you know, so this is the pairing that measures the skew symmetry of the tensors. We already used it. And now this is the tricky part. Okay, so he came up with this bracket, with this expression for a bracket in T plus D star, you know, which exactly uh, does the job. So, let me explain exactly how. So the first thing that I want to point out regarding this bracket is that the way I've defined it here, or I presented it here, uh, this is not uh, skew symmetric. Okay, it's a non skew symmetric bracket. And um, therefore, it's not a lead bracket. Okay, even though I won't write out all the all the properties that this bracket has. But um, you know, written in this way, it satisfies nice properties. So a version of the Jacobi identity and a version of the Leibniz identity as if it was a Lie algebraid, except that it's not skew symmetric. And then you may wonder, okay, I'll skew symmetrize it. Why not? Okay, so you skew symmetrize this bracket. And then what happens is that you lose the Jacobi identity and you lose the Leibniz property. Okay, so you can't have both. So this is really not um, a Lie bracket, but you know this can be understood, and you know this you know has been the subject of quite a bit of um, study. This can be understood as some kind of higher version of a Lie bracket, like a Lie two bracket or something like that. So like the, the the algebraic nature of this bracket is something that intrigued a lot of people for a lot, you know for a long time. And as I said, this is a prototypical example of something called, you know, a, a new entity called the current algebra. Okay, so what is a Dirac structure now? Okay, so how to use this bracket to measure integrability? So a Dirac structure is, you know, a Lagrangian subbundle of T plus T star, just as the graph of a two form and the graph of a bivector field, that is additionally involutive with respect to the current bracket. So we impose this, you know, Frobenius-like integrability. Okay? And it just happens that, you know, this totally, you know, this really does the trick. Okay? So perhaps one thing that I should mention is that there's an equivalent way to look at this integrability. which is often easier um, to handle, um, which is to define, um, so how do we denote this? So you can actually define some object here, some kind of three tensor like this. using the current bracket. Then it's a simple exercise to see that this condition, this involutivity condition, is equivalent to the vanishing of this three tensor. Okay, so why am I writing this as a three tensor? Just because you know, the, you know, the exterior derivative of a two form is a, is a three form. And that's what has to vanish for the form to be closed. And in the case of a bivector field, you take pi bracket pi, there is a tri-vector that should vanish for this to be integrable. So what I'm saying is that, you know, there is a try something in the story that should vanish for a Dirac structure to be integrable, okay? Good. So in the examples, so we have the definition. Now with this current bracket, we can talk about integrability. And um, 
So now this really, yes. Um, well, you know, if L is Lagrangian, it's a tensor. Yeah, right. Yeah, so that's, a, that's a, actually a good point. If I just write it like this, this expression may not be tensorial, but um, if you assume this, or just that it's isotropic maybe, yeah, then it is, okay. And, and, you know, and actually this equivalence relies on the fact that L is Lagrangian. Right, I mean, you see that. Um, oh, anyway, it's easy to see. Yeah. 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 The lack of symmetry. Um, Look at the expression of the current bracket. You know, there is a clear lack of symmetry in in the right. I mean, it's not really anti-symmetric or symmetric. So it, it exactly does the job of being linear when it has to be linear and quadratic when it has to be quadratic. And that's the the nice thing about it. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So in the case that you know you consider the graph of a two form. Where omega is a two form, then the integrability of this Lagrangian subbundle as a Dirac structure is exactly equivalent to this linear condition. Okay, that's it. It's a good exercise, just like calculations. You can see that the bracket does the job. And similarly, we consider the graph now of a bivector field, then integrability is equivalent to this condition, okay? And the easiest way to actually check that is considering this three tensor over here and just see what the tensor is in each case, right? So in, for example, here, if you consider sections um, of L of the graph of the form X, I, like this, I equals one, two, three, then gamma L of A1, A2, A3, exercise is D omega of X1, X2, X3. Okay, so this guy will be zero when this form is closed. And I'll let you figure this one out. Okay, here it's easier to consider now sections of the form um, by sharp of D F I, D F I. And then you see that the calculation this is precisely the Jacobiator. Okay, so just just work that out. So, which other um, examples are there of Dirac structure? So, um, I told you, like you know, two kind of extreme examples in the sense that you know. So these are exactly the Dirac structures that satisfy the additional condition that L intersects T star is trivial. Okay, so the subbundles, the Dirac structures, which are, you know, which intersect trivially T star, they are the graphs of something from T to T star. And these are exactly these guys. And the Dirac structures that, that are that intersect the T, TM trivially, these are graphs from T star to T, and these are exactly these guys. 
Okay, so presymplectic forms, you know, are precisely the Dirac structure satisfying this intersection condition, whereas Poisson structures are exactly the Dirac structures that satisfy this intersection condition. Okay. Now, what else is there? So, whenever you have, you know, a sub bundle of TM that is involutive. Okay, or just a sub bundle of TM for now, constant rank sub bundle. You can promote it to a Lagrangian sub bundle of T plus T star by considering it's annihilator. So you turn that canonically into a, a Lagrangian sub bundle of T plus T star. And then the integrability condition for this guy as a Dirac structure is equivalent to the involutivity of the distribution. It's another simple calculation. Okay, so you encode Frobenius integrability um, in this story as well. And there are many other examples. So, you know, I'll talk about submanifolds of Poisson manifolds in a little bit um, and how they inherit um, direct structures. Um, there are examples coming from generalized complex structures that I will mention briefly later. And also, you know, interesting examples of these objects only groups that I will mention a bit later too. Um, for the last two, I'll have to, um, you know, extend a bit the, the notion here, you know, to, to complex, um, you know, to the complexification of T plus T star and here like by turning on a closed three form in the background somehow. Anyway, I'll get to that. So here's a very nice example that I think was one of the motivating examples for Weinstein and Courant to, con to consider Dirac structures in the first place. So this was an example that came from physics as well. So, <clears throat> so, so um, I claim that, you know, this bundle here, so I'm telling you, so in R3, I'm telling you exactly how it is defined. You can check that this is Lagrangian. You know, it's isotropic. It has the right rank and it is closed under the current bracket. And this has the peculiarity that if, if Z is not zero, so away from, you know, um, from this locus, um, this happens to be the graph of uh, a bivector field. So the thing about Dirac structures is that, you know, I've presented examples, you know, from graphs, but in general, a Dirac structure will not be the graph of anything but it could be the graph of something in a certain region of your manifold, right? It could be even the graph of something else in another region of the manifold, okay? So this example is an example where, you know, this is the graph of a bivector field, you know, in this region of R3, okay? But this bivector field, if you write it down, is gonna be singular. So this is not a bivector field everywhere. And you could imagine, you know, you could think that, okay, I mean, this is just a singular Poisson structure. What can I do with it? You know, but then you realize that in fact, you know, there is a perfectly nice and smooth object that totally encodes it, you know? And, and, and the only thing about this object is that, you know, um, so it's the graph of this thing, of, of this singular Poisson structure, um, but, you know, it fails to be the graph of a bivector at certain points, but it's still a smooth bundle. You know, it's a perfectly smooth bundle. So sometimes you can encode singular Poisson structures as smooth objects by looking at Dirac structures. I think this example is very illustrated. <clears throat> okay, so some properties of Dirac structures, I'll just mention them briefly. But that's a first connection between Dirac structures and, you know, or a hint as to why they can be useful or what they can be useful for. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> one pro the, the first property I want to point out is that, um, so let's draw here. So this is TM, this is T star M, and here sits your Dirac structure, okay? And you have this natural 
projection on the T factor, right? So if you consider this vector bundle with this natural projection from L to T, and if you consider the restriction of the current bracket to sections of this vector bundle, right? I mean, it's involative, so it makes sense to restrict. This is a Lie algebraic. Remember that I told you that the current bracket is not a Lie bracket, but it becomes a Lie bracket once you restrict it to a Lagrangian subbundle. Okay, so even though this is not a Lie algebraic, you know, this, you know, T plus T star, you know, it accommodates many Lie algebraids inside. Okay, so the, 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 the anomaly of this um, current bracket kind of disappears once you restrict it to. Okay, so this is a Lie algebra. So where this is the anchor, right? So if you look at the image of the projection here, inside TM, you know, this gives, this defines what we can call in analogy with Poisson geometry, the characteristic distribution Okay, so in case this is the graph of a bivector field, this is precisely the image of pi sharp. Okay, and in the case of a bivector field, you know, so if L is the graph of a bivector field, then of course it's, you know, it's the graph of something from here to here, therefore it's isomorphic to T star M as a vector bundle naturally. And this is this becomes precisely the scotangent Lie algebra of a Poisson manifold that I explained yesterday. Okay, so it's really a, a natural generalization of that. Uh, <clears throat> now, so this guy being the distribution coming from a Lie algebra um, has leaves. Okay, so just as in the case of Poisson um, structures. So just as the case of Poisson structures, um, you get a, you know, so this distribution R is integrable and defines, you know, a decomposition of your manifold into a bunch of, you know, leaves, which is a singular foliation. And moreover, in the case of a Poisson structure, these leaves, they acquired um, symplectic structures. And in this case, leaves are pre symplectic. They acquire closed two forms on them, which may be degenerate. They don't have to be non-degenerate anymore. Okay. This. I mean, I could tell you exactly how they are defined. Interest of time, I won't do it now. I can do it later if I have time. So <clears throat> like a little summary of how we've relaxed things starting from a symplectic structure to get to Dirac structures. Now, having in mind, you know, this, this foliations that we have around, okay? So as I said in the beginning, you know, you know, symplectic geometry is the same thing as non-degenerate Poisson geometry, right? And then if now you consider, you know, arbitrary Poisson tensors, you know, you drop non-degeneracy, you know, if you have a symplectic perspective to it, what it means is that now you have a symplectic foliation. You have a decomposition of your manifold into symplectic leaves, okay? And now you take a step further, and what you do is that you relax the non-degeneracy condition of each leaf. And you just allow your leaves to be, you know, to have closed two forms and be pre-symplectic. And then the, the, the object, the global object associated with them is precisely what a Dirac structure is. Okay. So from this perspective, you know, I, I kind of always say that 
that I think a suitable name for Dirac structures would pro probably be pre-Poisson, pre right? So it's, they're like Poisson, but you know, you kind of relax a non-degeneracy condition. Okay, so there's something else that you can find on a Dirac structure, on a Dirac manifold, which is the fact that there is a second distribution around, which is not at all surprising if you have in mind that they are generalizing closed two forms. So whenever you have a closed two form, you can consider the kernel of this two form. Okay. Right, so these are, you know, at each point, the vectors that contracted with the two form give you zero. Okay, so this gives you some kind of distribution, except that it is a distribution that, you know, in Camilo, Camille's, Camille's language, how is it? It could have many spaghettis and only one lasagna. So like the bad type of distributions, which are not smooth unless they are constant rank, okay? So things like this, you could have this distribution being points everywhere and then in one single point being everything. Think about a kernel, right? I mean, think about the kernel of this two form in R2. So away from the origin, this is not degenerate. So it's kernel is point, it's trivial. And at the origin, this is zero. So its kernel is everything. So there's one point where the kernel is everything. And all the other, so, you know, this is like a non-smooth type of distribution, okay? But if you are in the case where this has constant rank, then, you know, this is a nice distribution that is more over integrable when the form is closed, okay? So if you have this around when you have a closed two form, you'll have an analog of that around for a Dirac structure, right? And that's how you define the so-called kernel of a Dirac structure. So at, at each point, this is nothing other than the kernel of the, you know, of the two form on the leaf to that point, right? It's just the kernel of the two form on the leaf through that point, okay? Um, <clears throat> And, and um, the interesting thing is that, you know, in principle, you know, if you take a Dirac structure, you know, um, what do you do when you have a pre-symplectic structure with a kernel? If you want to do symplectic geometry, you know, you, you mod out the kernel, right? You just remove the kernel, you try to go to a quotient, the leaf space of the kernel uh, whenever you can. So often this is realized as, you know, whatever, you know, tangent to orbits of a group acting, blah, 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 right? But in general, you know, if you take, if, if, if you have a pre-symplectic manifold and you mod out the kernel, you get something symplectic, right? Um, for a Dirac manifold, something very similar happened. So now if you have Dirac, a Dirac manifold, um, and you consider its kernel, assuming that this guy is constant rank and gives you a nice, beautiful, simple foliation, can you guess what this would be? Right? So I have like leaves which are pre symplectic. Now I'm modding out the kernel along each leaf. So each, you know, the image of each leaf down here now will be symplectic. And this will give you a decomposition of this guy into symplectic leaves. So this will be a Poisson manifold. But that, that's why I was saying, uh, you know, I was saying that, um, you, know, you know, Dirac structures are to Poisson structures exactly what pre-symplectic structures are to symplectic structures, you know. So a pre-symplectic structure, when you mod something out, it becomes symplectic. You know, a Dirac structure, when you mod something else, it becomes Poisson. Okay, so that's the idea. 
And you can talk about Hamiltonian vector fields and lots of other things. You know, you, you find the same difficulties that you already do when you have a pre-symplectic form. So for example, if you want to talk about, if you want to solve, if you want to solve, um, if you want to solve this equation, for a two form that is not non-degenerate, you're gonna have problems, right? So um, first of all, this guy may not, right? I mean, this, this, um, um, this map may not, you know, will not be surjective, right? So you may not be able to reach this guy with any vector field here. So there will be functions that do not admit Hamiltonian vector fields if the form is not not degenerate, is degenerate, right? And the other thing is that you know even if you can solve this, then you're going to have some you know this will not be completely well defined. It will be well defined up to the kernel of the two form, right? So the same thing, of course, will happen in Dirac geometry, right? But you can make sense of these things and see exactly what the ambiguity is, blah blah blah. Okay, and, um, and the other thing that is super important in this whole business, I won't get much into it now, is that <clears throat> um, this current bracket, and this, this is actually in the problem set, that this current bracket on T plus T star, it admits a new type of symmetry. So you can, you know, you can act on it just by lifting diffeomorphisms of the Bayes manifold in the natural way to T and T star, and this will preserve the current bracket. But there's a different way that you can find automorphisms of T plus T star that preserve the current bracket. And this is by means of closed two forms. So in the problem set, um, you know, there's a definition of, um, I think there it's called a gauge transformation maybe. It's, this is also goes by the name of B fields around. So there's a natural operation you know, that close, you know, there's a natural action of close two forms on T plus T star that preserve both the pairing and the current bracket. And therefore we'll send Dirac structures to Dirac structures. And sometimes Poisson structures to Poisson structures if there's an additional invertibility condition somewhere that is explained in the problem set as well. Okay, so this is a different, another source of examples of Dirac structures, you can be field them. So what is this B field anyway? You know, from the point, point of view of pre-symplectic foliations, this is just saying that, you know, if you view a Dirac structure in terms of the leaves and two forms along the leaves, and if you give me another close to form defined globally, you know, I just modify the foliation, you know, not touching the leaves, the leaves will be the same. And I just modify each leaf wise two form by adding to, to, to it, you know, the B, and this will give me a new Dirac structure. That's the idea, something very simple. And the other thing I want to mention, and I'll just mention very briefly, because it's one of the things that if, if you have seen before, fine, if not, um, I just want to leave a message clear, you know, uh, not really understanding formulas. But um, in the same way that one can pull back forms, but I mean, like, um, forms and by vector fields, they have different functorial properties, right? Usually vector fields or multi-vector fields are things that we think of them as objects that you can try to push forward, right? Or at least like have a notion, like a notion of relation, right? You say that two vector fields are related by a map, right? If, you know, the guys over here in the image of the guys over there, right? You all have seen this in geometry. Whereas two forms, they go in the other way, right? If you have a two form on the target manifold of a map, you can pull it back to the source manifold of the map, right? And um, Dirac structures, because they generalize both, you know, they have, you know, better functorial properties because you can do both operations with them, okay? So it makes sense to talk about, you know, pullbacks of Dirac structures. So I won't bother with the formulas at this point. I just show you that, you know, you can define if you're given a Dirac structure on M, there is a way that you can transport it back to define a Dirac structure on N 
there's a caveat. I'll tell you about it in a little bit, but you know, let's leave it like that for now. Um, and this leads to the notion of a backward Dirac map. And you know, the notion that you know, Poisson by vectors can be related by a map, like phi related, extends to the notion of a forward Dirac map. Okay, so what is the only problem with this? Is that, <clears throat> you know, one has to worry a little bit about, you know, transversality or cleanness issues. So point-wise, this make, makes perfect sense. And this would be, you know, a Lagrangian subspace of T plus T star at each point. But it may be that they won't fit together into a smooth bundle. It may happen. So you may have to, you know, throw in, you know, um, another technical assumption for this to be perfectly defined. Okay, so maybe if I have one minute, I think that's an interesting point, but let me just illustrate what could go wrong and why you have to, to throw something in. Um, okay, so consider as your target manifold R2, and on R2, consider this by vector, right, which defines a Dirac structure by its graph. And I'll consider R and the inclusion of R into R2 as the x-axis, okay? And let's see what happens when you pull back this ambient Dirac structure to this line, okay? I told you that, you know, we, we don't have to worry about the formulas. Let's just think about it for a second. Right, so <clears throat> yeah, so um, right, so if x is not zero, if we are away from the origin, this by vector field, right, is actually you can view it as a two form because it's not degenerate, and then pulling back means that you just pull back the two form, okay, so away from zero, you, you don't really have to know anything to know what to do. Right, you just pull back the corresponding form, okay? But you're pulling it back to R. Uh, how many two forms do you know in R? This one, right? I mean, just trivial, right? So if you think of it as a graph, you know, at each point here, it will be zero two form, which means T, right? In T plus T star, the zero two form is T, right? Now, if you look at the formula, what happens at this point, you will see that it will look like this. You will get a T star. Okay, so you see like at each point, it is a Lagrangian sub-bundle of, you know, of R, you know, of TR plus T star R, you know, but it doesn't fit into something smooth. So you have to throw in something else. Let me, okay, this was just like the, the caveat. Anyway, so again, now, you know, that you know how to, you know, take pullbacks, you know, you could, you know, um, study again, submanifolds inside Poisson manifolds or Dirac manifolds in general, right? You have an ambient Dirac manifold that put in a submanifold in there. And <clears throat> for example, if you have like this constant rank condition, the results will always be, you know, a Dirac structure on the submanifold. And you can actually measure what the kernel is of this pulled back Dirac manifold. And in some cases, if the ambient is Poisson, the result of this pullback will be Poisson again, right? As long as you know, this is zero. So if you adjust all the parameters of this operation, right, you can force a pullback of a Poisson, manif of a Poisson structure to be Poisson again. And this leads to several notions of um, submanifolds in Poisson geometry, which have this property. So they have their own uh, Poisson structure, but they don't sit inside the Poisson manifold as a Poisson submanifold, but rather the relationship between the ambient Poisson manifold and the, and the Poisson manifold of the submanifold is via a backward map, not a forward map, which would be a Poisson map. Okay, and in terms of the, the foliation, what this is basically saying is that you know you're intersecting, you know, 
uh, the submanifold intersects, you know, a bunch of symplectic leaves. And, you know, with the right cleanness or transversality assumptions, you know, if this intersection is a symplectic submanifold leaf by leaf, then you can put this together into a Poisson structure on the submanifold. But in general, it will be Dirac because the intersection will be just pre symplectic. Yes. Yeah, there's a pie shot missing. Yeah, sorry. I'm doing this at two in the morning after dinner has these problems. Yes, there's a pie shot missing. Okay, so you get a bunch of examples um, of, of this. You know, I'm just saying that, you know, it's a nice tool to understand submanifolds in Poisson geometry because of this backward operation. Good. Um, and, and this is the context, you know, for this uh, more recently called Poisson transversals, back at some point called cosymplectic submanifolds in physics. Um, Second, cl uh, second class, so these are called, this is like w where this Dirac brackets make sense. So this is exactly a situation where, you know, this backward, so the pullback of a Poisson structure is Poisson again. And when you write its bracket, you, you find this Dirac formula. Okay, now just to mention that you know, if you want to get more examples and, let, and, 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 you know, make the theory even richer, uh, there's one thing you can do, which is to twist the whole story by a closed three form. Okay, so in my last five minutes, I'll just, you know, flash some ideas. Okay, so, um, you know, how do you do that? So if you're given a closed three form, you can just change the current bracket by this closed three form and then repeat all the definitions of a Dirac, what a Dirac structure is, but using the new bracket. So for example, for a Poisson structure, the new integrability condition will look like this. You know, the three form will be controlling the lack, the failure of the Jacobi identity, okay? And this turns out to be something very relevant and useful because it gives, you know, examples of Dirac structures on Lie groups, which are twisted by the Cartan three form. So there's a whole family, you know, of Dirac structures of this type that turns out to be very, very, very important. Right, so this turns out to be my favorite Dirac structure. Okay, so I won't get into the formulas. No, the message is just that, that if you relax the condition a little bit and now, you know, um, um, dropping not only the non-degeneracy leafwise, but also the closeness of the form leafwise, by a three form, then you get even more interesting examples. And just to you know, mention very briefly some applications. So this is pretty much you know, all I wanted to say about Dirac structures. Now, I just want to give some very, um, well, just very fast some applications of what you can do with it. So first of all, remember that um, we spoke about you know, symplectic realizations or Poisson maps as being moment maps, right? Moment maps were examples of or symplectic realizations of the dual of the algebra. Now, you can play the same game, replacing the dual of the Lie algebra by a Lie group with this Cartan Dirac structure. You declare that to be now the, you know, receptacle of moment maps by, you know, like forward Dirac maps into the Lie group. And this leads to the notion, so this is the geometry behind the notion of group valued moment maps of Alexeyev, Malkin, and Myrenken. And the beauty of this story is that even though you are in a much more general context where you know, forms can be degenerate and can be non-closed by three forms, blah, 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 you know, performing the most natural reduction will still lead to honest symplectic or Poisson structures. You know, all these anomalies, they kind of cancel out when you reduce, okay? So you have a source of examples of symplectic and Poisson manifolds coming from a very a much more general framework that incorporates, for example, you know, um, various interesting modular spaces in gauge theory, okay? That you cannot describe um, with ordinary Poisson and symplectic structures in finite dimensions. You can in infinite dimensions, but if you want to do a finite dimensional construction, you have to 
go to the realm of Dirac structures to, to describe this well-known um, Poisson structures by Ati and Bot and so on. But, but this, this reduction is always symplectic or depends on the No, um, it depends on how you define this map that I'm not really defining for you. But if you define this map in the right way, it doesn't depend on the group. Okay. It's always symplectic. And if you, instead of putting a form there, right? So I'm seeing M as a Dirac manifold now given by a two form. So this form there is not symplectic. It's like, you know, can be degenerate in a certain way and it's not closed in a certain way, blah, blah, blah. If you, if you put um, now a Dirac structure instead of omega, then this quotient will be a Poisson manifold. And that's the case when you have boundaries on your surface. That you don't get symplectic anymore. You get Boisson. So the other slide I just want to flash because of next week is that this also this whole story of Dirac structures and current brackets is also the right formalism for this theory of generalized complex structures that will appear next week at the conference, at least in Gualtieri's talk, maybe in other talks. I don't remember. Oh, in in Krynik's talk, probably. Um, so, you know, which is basically the idea that if you now define, <clears throat> let me give you another definition. If you consider a Dirac structure on this complexified T plus T star, and we impose this intersection condition, right? So this is given by necessarily um, as the plus I eigen bundle of a map like that. Okay. And you can, you can include in this type of geometry, both symplectic and complex in equal footing. So if you consider this J over there, only in terms of this anti-diagonal um, elements. So I'm seeing this as acting on T plus T star. You put symplectic geometry in. If you use the diagonal elements, you put complex geometry in. And in general, a generalized complex will look like this, where this upper corner will be a Poisson structure that measures how far you are from being complex or symplectic, right? If it has full rank, it means that you are close to this. And if it has zero rank, it means that you are here, right? You have a symplectic foliation because of this Poisson structure that measures that kind of interpolates between complex and symplectic geometry. <clears throat> there are various aspects of the theory that have been developed in the last, by now, what, 20 years? Something like that. Um, and just another comment of like very recent work of um, Roberto and Don is like, what happens if you keep the same definition, but you relax this transversality condition here? Right? You just consider a more general complex Dirac structure. Maybe you put some regularity. Maybe you like to you know, say that this has you know, some kind of fixed um, rank. Okay? Then many interesting things happen. And you know, with, in the exact same way, you can incorporate um, you know, not only pre-symplectic on this side, but you know, um, you know, CR and transversally holomorphic structures. You know, many things happen if you just relax this. You know, but a lot of the theory, you know, kind of carries through to this more general setting. You can study like, you know, um, like a splitting theorem, blah, blah, blah. So that's like the work of, it was a PhD thesis of Dan at IMPA. And there are many other applications that I won't really, I don't have time to mention, but I'll just finish here. Thanks. Okay, it's time for questions. Uh, yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed that. Uh, I actually wanted to make a remark, yeah. uh, namely that so when Kuan first studied Kuan algebraids, the version of the bracket that he wrote down was the anti-symmetric yeah. version, and um, it took a while 
for people to figure out that Quran algebras are maybe nicer with the non-antisymmetric. And uh, this bracket that you saw today was actually first given by uh, Irene Dorfman. Dorfman, before, yeah, that's absolutely correct. For Quran. Yeah. And if people want to read up on sort of a nice historical overview for how these ideas develop, there's a really nice review paper by Yvette kosman Bach yeah. called Quran Algebraids, a short history, where you can yeah. see this. No, yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, I should have called this bracket that I wrote the Quran Dorfman, probably, bracket. Yeah. So Dorfman was studying like integrability of PDs and came up with the non skew symmetric version of the bracket, whereas Courant wrote the skew symmetric version of the bracket, and they were reconciled in work of, I think, Liu Xu and Weinstein afterwards. But yeah, that's a good point. Any other question or remark? Yes, I was going to ask. Uh, uh, somewhat related question. So um, there are a bunch of brackets which are related, like Dorfman bracket and Courant, in which we impose like a Jacobi is not satisfied, but it is anti-symmetric. So does it make sense to consider Dirac structures with respect to other related uh, brackets? Is there yeah. a related theory or yeah, is well, the right one? In some well, sense? okay, it, that's also a good question. I should have mentioned that. So um, for Dirac structures, it doesn't really matter, at least for the Courant or Courant Dorfman which one you use because when you restrict them to like range and sub bundles they coincide right the non skew symmetric becomes skew symmetric and the and the skew symmetric that didn't satisfy jacobi satisfies jacobi when you restrict the like range and sub bundles so they they coincide um so at least for these two i don't know which other brackets you have in mind but at least for these two versions of the current dorfman bracket they lead to the same theory of dirac structures Uh, so, uh, what's the finite dimensional Dirac structure that's associated to the modular space of uh, flat G bundles that you had mentioned? Okay. Uh, right. So, um, how can I answer that in one minute uh, or 30 seconds? Yeah, so the setup there. <clears throat> Let's see if I can do this. Okay, so let me go back. Okay, so that's the, that's the story, right? So um, if, you see, if, if you see like the construction of this modular space of flat G bundles, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking at them in terms of the holonomy of the bundles, right? That's why you get this, you know, this finite dimensional construction, right? Um, then um, on this guy, which are a bunch of copies of G2. So first of all, on this guy, you put this Cartan Dirac structure that I defined. So this is the Dirac structure whose leaves are the conjugacy classes of the group. And the two form is a two form that was even um, um, defined before by, by Weinstein, Lisa Jeffrey, and some other people. Um, anyway, so that's what you have on the target. And then, um, I told you that this guy was a Lie algebra, right? So you could try to integrate it, right? So if you integrate it, you know, a groupoid that integrates it is actually two copies of G. And this guy, just like a Poisson structure, becomes symplectic when you integrate. A Dirac structure becomes pre-symplectic when you integrate. So a two-form appears here coming from the integration of this guy, Okay. So this goes back to, you know, myself, Krynik, Zhu, Weinstein, and Ting Shu, whatever. And then you kind of take a bunch of products, right? So do this like this, but then you have to, whatever, fuse, you have to, whatever, you know, even modify this a little bit because it happens that, you know, if you want this to be still a, 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 a Dirac map for things to make sense, you have to modify this a little bit because you know the multiplication, you know, from from G times G to G is not really um, a direct map, but it is up to one of these B fields. So you have to kind of B field transform this a little bit, 
And then in the end of all this, there will be a nice two form over here that is the one you reduce to get the symplectic structure on the modular space. Yeah, sorry if that was kind of vague, but but what I'm saying is that you know you can construct everything out of this direct structure. These are like the source of all the structures you need to make sense of the symplectic structure of the modular space. All right. Yeah, yeah, these guys all, yeah, they become untwist, untwisted only after reduction, but they are all twisted, yes. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Thank you, Vero. You're welcome. <laughs> So at the end, you mentioned this, uh, well, general, generalization of generalized complex structures where you allow L intersected with L bar to be constrained or something. And for generalized complex, you have the Poisson structure somehow interpolating between symplectic and, and uh, complex. Um, yeah. Do you still have a Poisson structure in this more general case or what would be the structure there? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. So in this case, you know, if you make the right regularity assumption you know, like, you know, this, this real index being constant, whatever, what you get is a real Dirac structure underlying this complex Dirac structure, which is, you know, analogous to the Poisson structure that you get in the case of a generalized complex, right? So a real Dirac gives you a pre-symplectic foliation. And it is this pre-symplectic foliation, you know, the rank of that will kind of interpolate between different things now. Yeah. If it's like, you know, more like CR, it's more complicated there, but you know, if, if it's more like CR or more like pre-symplectic, there's a, a certain real Dirac structure in the story that helps you to understand things. But you can ask Roberto and Dan directly about this. Okay, one more. Okay. Who is asking? Yeah, so a very naive question. I mean, uh, what's the relation between this deluxe, uh, Dirac structure and a Dirac? I mean, uh, and Dirac what? Di uh, the the physicist Dirac. I mean, how you name it? Ah, I thought I had motivated that. Um, the let's go back to the very first slide. Oh no, too far. So the motivation was this bracket the so-called Dirac bracket, because the understanding of like, you know, how to extend this bracket to Poisson geometry has to do with understanding, you know, different types of submanifolds in Poisson geometry. And to understand the geometry of submanifolds in Poisson geometry, you know, you're, you're kind of naturally led to, to um, Dirac structures, you know, just asking yourself this question, you know, like if you cut out a submanifold inside a Poisson manifold, what is its geometry? What kind of geometrical structure it inherits? You know? Oh, no. I mean, Dirac did many things and made him, fa yeah, made him famous. Um, yeah, you have like the Dirac operator, which is like another story. You have quantum mechanics, which is another story. And you have like the theory of constraints. And it's because of his work in the theory of constraints that this was named after him. Yeah. yeah, I have a comment about that, which is even more advertisement of Dirac structures that they also work very nicely in infinite dimensions. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And yeah. it does happen that the Dirac operator can be seen as a Dirac structure. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but it was not the motivating example. Let's put it this way, you know. <laughs> In, in the end, I think everything is kind of the same up to homotopy or something, but <laughs> somewhere. Uh, any other questions? So all the questions were saved to the end, apparently. So um, I, I was kind of curious about more about the relationship between the, um, the current orphan bracket and the um, and the Scouting bracket. Oh, so is there like, um, I mean, I guess the Scouting bracket is like a graded thing, uh, right? Is there some sort of graded 
uh, Quran Dorf node bracket on like top like wedge powers of this bundle that is related to this Gaussian bracket in some way. Mm. Yeah, off the top of my head, I can't give you a good answer, but um, yeah, I mean like higher versions, like you know, going to higher degrees. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I've seen that, but it's likely that there's something around uh, about this. Yeah. Um, there's this theorem by Rotenberg that current algebra are the same as uh, symplectic. Great. Yeah. yeah. So that's so the that's this. And, yeah. That's this part over here. Yeah. yeah. And and from this point of view, you can generalize the bracket, the current bracket to. Yeah. Um, yeah. Power. But it's, it's not le it's not really it, that's right. Yeah. But it's not really to powers like the skeleton bracket. But yeah. But you do have. Mm -hmm. You know, you can write, yeah, you can write the current bracket, as he's saying, as some kind of, um, what's it called? What's the name? Derived, of it? derived bracket. bracket. Derived bracket with respect to a certain charge using, you know, the, the canonical, um, yeah, symplectic structure on a certain graded manifold. And in, in, that, in that case, yeah, you can make sense. Yeah, you can, it, it, there's a broader view to this. Um, but I'm not sure if it's totally related, um, yeah, to the skeleton bracket. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think that um, skeleton bracket is kind of like the um, product, prototype example of um, odd um, graded symplectic manifolds in degree one. So, that's right, yeah. So yeah, they live in different degrees, that's the point. Yeah, and this is degree two, so, yeah. so degree one. The, the skeleton bracket, that's a good point. So the skeleton bracket is the canonical symplectic structure. So I think I mentioned it in one line and one slide in the, well, I'll never get to it because there are so many slides, but um, I think when I spoke about You see, there's a lot hidden in these lines. So this line says exactly what he's saying. That the skeleton bracket is the canonical um, symplectic structure on a, on, a, on a graded cotangent bundle, but you, you, the shift is by one. And the current bracket happens in, in the next level. Yeah. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's then you can repeat it.